<gasps> D and D tips from brand new cherry flavor. William, if you want to be successful on YouTube, you have to eat this entire Tupperware container full of gross stuff for the next 24 hours. It's magic, I promise, but I will require a weird payment. Can, can I ask what this is? You absolutely cannot. This video is part one of my Halloween double feature. The next video will come out tomorrow if you're watching this on release day and will cover the beautiful and terrifying Midnight Mass. But if you're watching this at a time when both videos are out, then I highly recommend grabbing the next video and queuing it up right after this one on your YouTube player. Grab yourself a soda and some candy corn and let's get spooky. These two videos will attempt to analyze the tropes and the genre structure of the two shows we are talking about. As such, while there will be some spoilers, I am actively making an effort to keep this as light on spoilers as I can, and at no point do I spoil any major plot details or the fates of any characters. Set in 1990s LA, Brand New Cherry Flavor is a world of grime and glamour in equal measure. It draws so strongly from grindhouse traditions in not only its aesthetics and visuals, but also the way that it crafts and tells its story. If you don't know what a grindhouse is, a grindhouse was a type of cinema that existed between the 70s and 80s, and focused mostly on those sort of controversial or lurid or graphic low-budget films that wouldn't make it in normal theaters. Splatter films, schlocky horror, and things that were a touch too, shall we say, lurid for normal cinema, all those things were the bread and butter of grindhouse cinema. The point is that brand new cherry flavor is The point is that brand new cherry flavor is heavily influenced by grindhouse cinema and your games of Dungeons and Dragons absolutely can be as well. The twin things that I deem essential to telling a grindhouse story are sleaze and hitting that exact sweet spot of unbelievability. Grindhouse cinema almost always contained some element of sleaze. Sometimes this sleaze was in the effort of appealing to somewhat sleazy viewership and was made for their benefit. However, other times it was simply to set up the villainy of a bad guy and show how sleazy that person was. In-game, you can show off your atmosphere in much the same way. Describe greasy, smoky locations with antagonists who are chugging down cheap whiskey, clad in ratty bathrobes. At the end of the day, Grindhouse is gross. So make your villains gross. Now for unbelievability. Grindhouse films are notoriously poorly written and filled to the brim with plot holes. Brand New Cherry Flavor, on the other hand, is actually quite well written. And yet, it still accomplishes that slight air of unbelievability. That little air of surrealness that adds to that effect. The sweet spot is for all of the characters to act about 10% off from how real humans would react to things. You know, like it's not enough to really take you out of it, but it is definitely enough to make all the interactions seem strange and amusing. Brand New Cherry Flavor handles this primarily with how all of the side characters react to Lisa's witchcraft. Like, you know, it's a little bit believable that people would just humor this crazy-eyed lady who insists she's trying to put a curse on someone. So if we take that as our starting point, and then we take a step 10% away from believability, we hit the sweet spot that the show does, which is that instead of just humoring her, they just don't really seem to care. <laughs> um putting a curse on him and I need some of his pubic hairs. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's perfect. That's dope. That's awesome. Pretty much all of the side characters are extremely blasé, and it adds this wonderful depth of humor to the show. You can take that for yourself if you create a bunch of blasé side characters, or even just one very well-placed character who is blasé and unflappable. You could have an urban fantasy sort of game, when the players keep going into the library to look up books on, like, ritual sacrifice and horospacy and stuff, the librarian can just be like, yeah, I don't care, it's over there. Confession. I'm a bit blasé myself in real life, so this has filtered down on occasions into some of my characters. So I can personally say from experience that these hyper-blasé characters 
usually ended up being player favorites out of all the NPCs they met. Even if you're not going for anything related to Grindhouse at all, consider throwing in a character or two who acts like this. The players will usually love them. William, it's time for your first payment. <clears throat> oh, something's wrong. <clears throat> oh yeah, sorry, something's really wrong. <clears throat> I just vomited you out, buddy. Yes. Yes, I did. I vomited you out. Yeah. Yeah, I puked you right out. That was... That was not fun. It was not fun, buddy. I know. Let's not do that again. Thanks. I'll take that dog off your hands. Fuck yeah. I love dogs. The big bad evil guy can sometimes be a difficult character to properly present to your players. You want your big bad evil guy to maintain some presence through the campaign so that your players can build up their rivalry with them, and thus the final fight will actually kind of mean something. However, you also need to maintain enough distance so that you don't accidentally pit your players and your antagonists together too early. This will either lead to a sudden and unexpected TPK, or if they somehow win, well then the campaign is over early and nobody really wants that. I present to you the Boro solution to this problem. There is never any doubt from the moment we see her on screen that Boro is the ultimate villain of this story. However, there's always, at every step of the plot, there's something in the way of Lisa finally confronting the witch. They need each other, you see. And every time Lisa thinks she can finally handle Boro, suddenly there's something she needs Boro for. This is actually a fantastic character dynamic for your big bad evil guy in your campaign. Give your players and your big bad evil guy lots of constant common threats that they have to band together to defeat. The players will know that this impromptu ally will eventually be their enemy, but they're never quite at the moment when they can actually take him down. Witches and hags are actually a very natural fit into this role, because they can perform all sorts of little spells and rituals that the players just don't have access to. They also happen to have a long list of people they have screwed over, so there is no shortage of people who you can make the common enemy between your witches and your player characters. Now, I won't spoil what Boro's actual plan is, but I will say that in your games, your witch or big bad evil guy who's following this structure can be prepping or grooming the player characters for some form of ritual or scheme. Something that will ultimately come to fruition at the end of the campaign and finally result in the climax of the plot. And in a relationship like this, don't be afraid to get the big bad evil guy to be somewhat friendly or even paternal or maternal towards your players. Boro does this towards Lisa, and it adds this wonderful complexity to it, especially considering that Lisa has some problems with the fact that her mother is nowhere to be found. And those are my best D&D tips from Brand New Cherry Flavor. I hope you've enjoyed this and found the information useful, and if so, I hope you follow through into the second episode of the double feature. Good job! Now we have some preparations for you to make for the next video if you want to be a good YouTuber. Really? What do you need me to do? Sleep. Okay, I'm going to pull some shit out of his nose and eat it. Like this video and subscribe to the channel or this might accidentally fucking kill him. See you in the next video.